right, I'm going to kick us off. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm Will Fenton, Director of Research and Public Programs at the Library Company of Philadelphia. I recognize a lot of these attendees, so you've heard my spiel before, but I'll give it in the most compressed form. The Library Company, we were founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1731, but we've changed a lot over the past 289 years. Today, we are an independent research library with terrific programs in um, uh, poli uh, political economy and business history, um, early Americana, African American history, women's history, and of course, our visual culture and graphic arts department. Um, this is our fireside chat webinar series. This is a weekly series that is very much sustained by our learning community. And we conceive that as broadly as possible. So that begins a lot with our research fellows who we support and have supported for the past 34 odd years. But it also includes all sorts of other um, uh, patrons of the library company, including uh, students who make very um, heavy use of our collections. And this is an unusual fireside in the sense that it is a two part fireside. So I encourage you to come back next Thursday. But it's also going to be a bit more collaborative uh, than you're used to hearing. Instead of just having to hear from me and maybe one speaker, we're going to have um, two uh, speakers and also three students from Temple University, a graduate program. Uh, so I'm really excited to see how this unfolds. And I'm also delighted that I can sort of uh, turn this over to someone else and uh, play the role of attendee for once. So before I turn it over to our MC this evening, I just wanna draw your attention to one key feature in this. Uh, this is a slightly different permutation of Zoom than you might be accustomed to. You can see us, we don't have to see you. So you can let your hair down, you can put your feet up, you can pour yourself a glass of wine, but you can still participate. And the best way to do that is through the Q&A feed. Uh, there's two overlapping dialogue buttons at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you can submit a question. And you don't have to wait until you're prompted at the very end of this. You can submit your question as soon as it reveals itself to, your, to, 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 to a you. So feel free to submit it early and often. Uh, we're gonna have plenty of time for uh, questions. And uh, with that, let me turn it over to Erica Piola, our Curator of Graphic Arts and the Director of our Visual Culture Program. Erica. Great, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, and again, thank you, Will. Um, as Will said, I am Erica Piola, Director of the Visual Culture Program, as well as Curator of Graphic Arts at the Library Company. Before we start tonight's art and spectacle chat of students' insights from working with objects of visual culture from the library's holdings, I wanted to give everyone a brief background as to how this collaboration between Dr. Powell's class and the visual, Pro visual culture program began. Early this year, I was delighted to be approached by Erin about an idea for an experiment she had for an embedded art history class at the library. I had the fortune of working with Erin in some of her art history classes for on-site collection overviews over the last few years. The classes, the classes had focuses on the historical significance and relevance of American popular and vernacular artworks, which are a focus of the graphic arts collection and the visual culture program. Her current fall semester class and its exploration of spectacle and the historical construction of vision as founding conditions of art reception in the United States during the long 19th century have continued these partnerships in breadth and depth. The VCP's collaboration with the class epitomizes its mission to promote visual literacy and the creative use of historical visual materials for the study of the past. Initially discussed as a series of object lessons, lesson classes on site with Aaron or myself, discussing select graphic materials related to topics ranging from technology, optics, and illusion, to practices of display and circulation, as evident in albums and scrapbooks, the classes necessarily shifted to the virtual environment and the world of Zoom, and more of a focus on the library's digital catalog. Beginning in September of this year, the experiment began. Every other week, graphic holdings from the, library's company, the library company's collections took center stage in PowerPoints as we examined issues of class, gender and race, hypervisibility and invisibility, provenance, and the influence of archival and curatorial practice in reading visual materials. As part of their coursework, students picked an item from the library's collections and have analyzed the object in terms of what we see and how and why we see it as we do. Reference and feedback sessions facilitated this work. A particularly favorite moment for me was my remembering a campy photograph that showed a procession with a Benjamin Franklin impersonator that I thought was the Franklin Club, but turned out to be the Poor Richards Club. I have to admit, I still had to share that photo with the student and his, uh, his talk is actually next week. 
Um, before I introduce Aaron, I want to say how much of a pleasure, it was really a, truly a pleasure to work with this class and wonderful learning experiences has been for me. Researchers looking anew at materials you have worked with for many years always brings fresh insights. I would now like to introduce Dr. Aaron Powell, Assistant Professor of American Art at Temple University. Aaron, whose research focuses on intersections between elite and popular forms of expression in the 19th and 20th centuries, and who is finishing a book project in Napoleon Cerrone and the Art of Living Pictures, will speak a bit more about the class and the students presenting tonight. Thank you. Uh, th thanks so much for the kind introduction, Erica. I am extremely proud of the institutional partnership between the library company and Temple that you and I have organized this fall. And I truly could not have imagined a more thoughtful, generous, and creative collaborator. In my view, this course's success through numerous changes in form has been a testament to the type of resiliency and constant pivoting that the COVID era has demanded of all of us. And I hope it might suggest a model for how cultural institutions and higher education can continue to support one another in the future. As Erica mentioned, our initial plan, which was hatched just before the emergence of the pandemic, was to create a graduate seminar that would function as an on-site practicum for archival work in US visual and material culture. So basically just exactly the type of thing that COVID made absolutely impossible. Instead, our work this fall has been done remotely via Zoom and through Erica's intrepid efforts to bring the material facts of the library company graphic arts collection remotely to graduate students at Temple. And though I worried at first that this shift to an online format could diminish our engagement with the subject of spectacle in the 19th century United States, I found that ultimately it's really highlighted instructive parallels between the historical emergence of early mass visual culture and the media phenomena of the present digital era. The experience has been additionally instructive, I think, in fostering a heightened sensitivity for what visual media obscures about history and what it preserves and enhances. In that regard, our seminar group has been extraordinarily fortunate to draw upon the, the amazing resources of the library company digital collection, including beautifully scanned images, thorough and thoughtful cataloging, and an array of online exhibitions. That our students have been able to accomplish so much from afar testifies to the skilled intellectual work of the library company team, as well as the tremendous educational dividends of making a genuine institutional investment in visual culture. So although I still look forward to a time when we can make our dreams of a hands-on course a reality, I am deeply appreciative of the wealth of resources that the Library Company of Philadelphia continues despite challenging circumstances to make available to their public. And on behalf of the entire Art and Spectacle Seminar at Temple University's Tyler School of Art and Architecture, I offer a heartfelt thanks to Erica and the Visual Culture Program for making this semester such a rich and rewarding educational experience for us all. And so with that, I would like to turn to this evening's main event, which is our students' presentations. Um, though before we begin, I must say too that the graduate student research you're about to hear is evidence of the resilience and dedication of a really extraordinary group of emerging scholars and artists. I count myself really lucky to have had the opportunity to work with such a talented group this semester. And I'd like to thank them too um, for embracing the experimental nature of the seminar and for rising to every challenge with good spirits intact. I think fall 2020 has been a real exercise in strength training for us all. Um, and I am so proud of what you've all accomplished in spite of that. So I am going to introduce each of the students individually um, and I will pop back periodically between talks to introduce our next speaker. So um, first up tonight is Emily Schollenberger. Um, Emily is a PhD student in the Department of Art History at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University, where she specializes in modern and contemporary art and visual media. And tonight she's going to be sharing her research on the Anne Lewis Memory Album. So Emmy, I'll give you a chance to go ahead and share your screen and then I will get out of your way. All right, thank you for that introduction, Erin, and thank you um, to Erica and Will for making this evening possible for us. I'm excited to 
um, be with everyone virtually and, and share a little bit of what I've been working on. Um, in 2000, about half a dozen albums were donated to the library company of Philadelphia. These albums had been in the donor's family for over a hundred years and are a trove of personal memories and stories. And this is one of the albums. It's titled Memories of the Home of, of Grandma Lewis and was made in 1896 by a Philadelphia woman named Ann Lewis. And she made it as a gift for her grandchildren. And it first caught my attention because of how beautifully it's assembled. Um, and because of the range of materials inside it, including photographs, um, clippings and memorabilia, pieces of fabric, watercolors, and hand-painted decorations, like the border around the photograph that you see on this title page. However, the album is much more than a pretty collection of memorabilia. It demonstrates a tension between enjoying progress and the benefits of modernity and clinging to the desire to preserve memories of a nostalgic past. The album transforms the rapidly modernizing urban setting of Philadelphia into nostalgic memories that preserve the Lewis family's identity. Anne's husband, George Albert Lewis, had already researched and recorded the family history. And that takes up most of the other albums that are in the library company's collection. And he encouraged her to write down quote, a very simple story of the homes in which our life has thus far been passed, end quote. Anne's narrative centers on the houses that the Lewis family lived on, starting with their marriage in 1851. And the 45 years that her album covers include momentous events in American history that she experienced from Philadelphia, including the Civil War, Lincoln's assassination, and the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. In 1896, poised on the, debt, on the brink of a new century, many people, like Anne Lewis, were looking back to the past. Anne's very simple story forges complex links to the family's past through their domestic spaces and memories. Throughout the album, the themes of memory, family identity, and modernity resurface again and again. We can trace these themes through three particular objects in the album, although the album is a wealth of objects and images. The first object that we can focus on is this rectangle of purple silk. The fabric is carefully mounted and the silver foil that's stamped with this slight pattern that's around it makes it seem precious and valuable. The caption identifies it as a piece of the dress that was worn by Anne Lewis in the 1853 daguerreotype from which the medallion on the title page was copied. And sure enough, you can just make out the textured pattern of the, or the checkered pattern um, from this fabric swatch on Anne's dress in the photograph from the frontispiece. Having an actual piece of the fabric in the album brings life to the black and white portrait, adding color and texture to the reader's experience. Other textiles appear throughout the album. Carefully mounted ribbons from bonnets and lace from Anne's wedding dress also add a tactile dimension to the album. This yellow ribbon was worn on a bonnet by Anne's mother-in-law, Eliza Lewis, who lived with the family for several years until she passed away in 1865. While most of the textiles in the album are smooth and pristine, this ribbon is slightly discolored and wrinkled and creased. You can imagine it being tied in a bow under Eliza's chin. Pieces of clothing like this add a bodily connection to the photographs of the Lewis family, bringing to life both recollections of Anne's days as a new bride and to memories of deceased loved ones. Textiles like the ribbon and the purple silk work in tandem with the photographs in order to form a physical and embodied connection to these family members actual to their family members descendants bringing life so that they have more than just their, their flat photographic images. 
So family photographs and mementos like this are standard fare for memory albums. But the album's pages are also filled with uh, photographs and paintings of the homes where the Lewises lived. Like the pieces of clothing, these rooms and their furnishings also serve as physical links to the family's history, bringing us to our second object. Anne describes a clock that had belonged to her husband's grandfather, who was a German mercenary war soldier who fought with the British during the Revolutionary War. And instead of going back to Germany after the war, chose to stay in the brand new United States. And the clock that he owned was passed down through the family. Here we can see it through a doorway in one of the watercolors made by Anne's husband, Albert. And on a side note, these watercolors are incredible. There's multiple um, small but incredibly detailed uh, watercolors throughout the album that capture every detail of color and texture that filled the Lewis's homes. The clock appears at least five times throughout the album in the slide on, or the, the painting on the previous slide, as well as in more paintings um, of a library, a back bedroom, in a pen and ink sketch, and in this photograph and another of the same room. The clock's box-like simplicity contrasts with the grandeur of the dining room in this photograph on the lower left. It sits on a mantle between two miniature suits of armor with an imposing arrangement of armor and weapons hanging above it. The dining room's Turkish rug and embossed wallpaper also outshine this pretty simple clock. But to Anne, this clock linked the present with the past. She wrote that it, she wished it could tell all of the family history that it had witnessed. And she even imagined that it felt sadness when her mother-in-law, Eliza Lewis, passed away and that it chimed tenderly on the day of her funeral. The clock was a witness to both these personal memories and to the family's longer history and their German heritage. The photographs of the clock bring us to the third and final object, the wallpaper which appears behind it in the Delancey Place dining room. So the wall wallpaper um, that comes halfway up the photograph um, on this slide. The same wallpaper appears uh, again in one of the watercolors. In this painting of part of the dining room, Albert Lewis captured the wallpaper's golden sheen and the way the light shines off the raised edges of the embossed pattern. Anne writes uh, extensively about wallpaper in her album. She says that she initially papered the parlor in this same house with plain paper because ornate patterns didn't become popular until after the Centennial Exhibition of 1876. Then later she redid the room with an embossed French wallpaper. The dining room wallpaper in the album um, is a heavy gold embossed Japanese paper. So continuing in this trend for more elaborate and ornate wallpapers. Wallpaper seems mundane, but it was perhaps unexpectedly a sign of the new flourishing consumer economy. In the 1870s, more and more wallpaper was being manufactured in the United States instead of having to be imported. And there was a growing taste for complicated patterns inspired by medieval and 17th century designs. So Anne's fashionable wallpaper combines admiration for the past with eagerness to acquire and display modern consumer goods. Her descriptions of her homes shows this tension between modernity and the past. She writes that although furniture styles had drastically changed twice since she bought the house, she preferred our old friends to modern fashions. That in spite of this attachment to old friends like the clock, she still kept up with fashion when it came to wallpaper. Other parts of her life also show this tension between nostalgia on one hand and the comforts of modern life on the other. She lamented the growing development of Philadelphia and the noise and smell that came with it. But she enjoyed using the very modern Pennsylvania Railroad to travel to fashionable summer resorts. 
Likewise, she clung to old relics like the clock, while also decorating her home with carpets and wallpapers that were produced by modern manufacturing. The selective acknowledgement of modernity is mirrored in Anne's selective narration of her life. Her simple story of old memories is relatively untroubled by the chaotic or upsetting portions of her life and the country's history. She does record the Civil War and Lincoln's assassination, but they receive much less space than happy family stories and descriptions of home decor. And although the deaths of her in-laws and her mother happened over a period of 14 years, they're all grouped in the same section of the album, right after her account of Lincoln's death. All of these opportunities or, or occasions for grief and mourning are compartmentalized in the album. And Anne doesn't dwell on gloomy times. At the end of her narrative, she writes that she could count the family's trials and sorrows but that their blessings were beyond counting. They were too numerous. A Harper's Weekly essay from 1912, just a few years after she made this album, declared that memory is the basis of identity. And Anne ensured that her family's identity was based on tranquil, happy memories. The objects she included, clothing from her newlywed days, paintings of lovely room with beautiful wallpaper, and a drawing, of a sentimental clock. All, uh, all these objects weave the nostalgic past and the bustling modern present into a deceptively simple story of happy family memories. Thank you. Wow, that was terrific, Emily. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll now introduce our second presenter for this evening, Claire Nichols. Claire is an artist, weaver, and educator based in Baltimore and a first year MFA student in the textiles program at Temple University's Tyler School of Art and Architecture. Her talk tonight will describe her encounter and thoughtful engagement with a mysterious object found in one of the library company's books. Thank you, Erin. Um, and I wanna give a particular shout out to Erica. Um, she's been such uh, a joy in our classes. And as someone who hasn't been able to be on campus, uh, she's been really extra um, special to work with. Uh, so she's really like bending over backwards to get us all the information that we need. Um, so uh, here we are. Uh, I am here to talk about this mysterious object. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, the library companies things left in books collection. And then I'm gonna zoom into uh, one of those objects in particular and talk about that object's probable context. So just to give you a little survey of the things left in books collection, uh, it's what it sounds like. Uh, the library company uh, would be given donated books and then there would be things tucked within these pages. Uh, <clears throat> there was a practice uh, for many years that, that it would, uh, accession those objects in a different way. These objects would be uh, collected into uh, different portfolios or folders uh, and separated from their books so that information about their origin has been lost. This practice has been discontinued uh, since the 80s. Uh, so now there are accession numbers to track uh, where things have come from uh, so that objects uh, remain um, uh, cognizant of their provenance, I suppose. <clears throat> Here are some two uh, delightful paper dolls from the collection. I really like the pink dress on the right. And then um, just to be clear, I'm being very biased and showing you my favorites from the collection. Uh, and here's some two other paper dolls. And I just wanna point out the sheer brilliance of using this textured paper on the, um, the black horse. I think that's just brilliant. Uh, not all of these objects are, uh, total mysteries. There's also like newspaper clippings, some sync cards and ribbons. Uh, one of these paper dolls has the date 1847 on the back. So that one has a little more information than some of these. But uh, overall, the um, they are collected together based on their provenance, based on their being left in a book. So um, 
just because one has a date on it doesn't mean that they all have that same date because they all enter this collection at different times. So the object in particular I'm gonna talk about tonight is this, uh, this uh, beautiful, charming little Schnernstitte. Uh, I really love the, like the little lovebirds kissing and also I just wanna point out the detail of their little pinprick eyes. Um, the scan shows that we can see a site where the pin entered and also where the pin exited in the making of the eyes. And I, uh, I'm just absolutely obsessed with this detail. Uh, so uh, Schnirnschitte is a uh, German language speaking uh, culture tradition brought to the United States uh, by immigrants from these cultures. And um, I'm sorry if my German pronunciation is off. Uh, I'm doing my best and there's gonna be more German, so uh, brace yourself. And this object, uh, other than being totally charmed by it, uh, it also has this sense of mystery uh, to me. Uh, since this object is a little unmoored in the collection, I wanted to think expansively about its possibility. Uh, I do have a, a larger arc of research, but tonight for time considerations, uh, I'm going to uh, focus in and talk about the shift from center to margin of Schnirnschitte in the United States. So first we have to talk about paper. Uh, this is an illustration from the library company's collection of William Rittenhouse's house. Uh, it's located in Germantown, you can visit it. Uh, William Rittenhouse uh, established the first paper mill in British North America in 1690. This illustration is from the 1920s. The mill itself was taken down in 1891 uh, because it was polluting the city's water supply and uh, no one wants that. So uh, the Philadelphia area was a big center for paper making and publishing. In 1769, there were 26 paper mills operating in the 13 colonies and 20 of them were in the Philadelphia area. This preponderance of paper means that paper is available for people around here in this area and is one of the reasons why um, decorative paper arts such as Schnernschnitte and its cousin tractor uh, could be so popular in this context. Uh, so uh, I do want to apologize to Erica for a little bit since I am borrowing some images from the Free Library, uh, the Free Library of Philadelphia's collection of Fractor. Uh, this one is, this is a Schnernschnitte in that collection. Uh, and I like it because uh, it's kind of an inverse of the object uh, I've been focusing on with the one central tree and two little birds instead of two big birds. Uh, so uh, cutting paper has existed since the beginning of paper, or I should say cutting paper decoratively, naturally. Um, and the Schneerenstein tradition of cut paper has its roots in gift and gift giving. A young woman would cut small designs to fit inside the lids of watches. Uh, they were theoretically to keep the dust off the face of the watch, but uh, they were mostly a sign of affection uh, for their bows. In addition to watch papers, young women would exchange cut papers with each other as tokens of friendship called friendship carton. Uh, these were shaped like hearts, ovals, or envelopes, and were often further decorated with painted wreaths, flowers, and verses or quotes. Uh, this is a Liebstrief for love letter for Barbie, Barbara Mueller. Her name is in the center. Uh, so this is all handmade uh, and Schneerenschitte means scissors, scissor cuts. So these were all made with uh, tiny little scissors. Uh, so just imagine like the painstaking labor that goes into something like this. Uh, and then here's a, uh, another Liebstrief. Uh, this one from 1809. Uh, and I would like to point out that it has um, this message on the inside and the painted portions of it would be so that it would be folded up and the painted portions would be on the outside. And then you'd unfold it in order to uh, reveal the rest. So the folding paper isn't just for creating symmetrical motifs uh, and the creation of these kinds of objects. It can also be part of interacting with the letter, with the receiving of it. And uh, handmade Schnirnschitte began to decline in popularity with the rise of manufactured valentines and manufactured paper lace. 
uh, paper lace was first manufactured in 1850. Uh, the preeminent Valentine scholar Nancy Rosen writes, the lacy designs created by knight work and often combined with intricate print pricking imitated real lace. As we follow the history of the Valentine, we can see them as the obvious forerunner of the famous manufactured die cut embossed lace papers with their similar decorative motifs. So here's an example of a Victorian Valentine, this from the collection of the Met. Uh, I wanted to show how um, intricate the machine made lace could be. Uh, and uh, also show that the one of the modes of uh, visual making that the Victorian Valentines would be in with the um, with layering with collage. So this purple heart uh, sort of shows off uh, the negative space in the lace. Uh, and the love of Valentines that the Victorians had uh, was really also tied up in their love in sending things through the mail. Uh, in the United States, the Postal Service reduced its rates in 1845 and began to issue stamps in 1847. By 1851, a letter could be sent 3,000 miles for three cents. Uh, this was also during the times when established official mail routes were being uh, established in all cities and towns. And also at the same time, trains and train routes were becoming more widespread and being used to uh, assist with mail delivery. So mail was also could go farther and could go farther faster. Here's another example of a Victorian Valentine, this one from uh, Nancy Rosen's collection. And uh, you could purchase a ready-made Valentine or you could purchase the paper lace to include in your own handmade uh, confection. Similar to Valentine's today, you can kind of make them yourself or buy them outright. Uh, this one I wanted to show, I wanted to show some lace that wasn't white uh, and also just sort of show how jam-packed visually the Victorian Valentines could get. They could get really like incredibly dense. Uh, so this is an example of machine cut paper lace by itself, not a Valentine. Uh, this is from the library company's archives and it is coincidentally also from the Things Left in Books collection. Uh, in the digital collection, it's uh, paired with this Schneerenschnitte. Uh, if you're looking at the bird's paper cut, there will also be an image in the corner pointing you to this object also. So uh, I kind of love that we have these bookends to this tradition of paper gift giving, the handmade and the mechanical. And then uh, speaking of bookends, uh, just to return to this idea of something left in a book, often the safest place to store something really intricate and something uh, lovingly handmade for you would be within a book. Um, you imagine it's really stable, it's on a shelf, it's not going to move a lot. And since it is folded and already has that fold in it, it's uh, very easy to store by folding it up and keeping it pressed flat. So. I can only speculate about how this object in particular got into the collection. Um, it could be something as simple as out of sight, out of mind. Uh, someone didn't know that this object was in the book, whether that person had made this object or had it given to them, or um, maybe uh, uh, someone's child uh, was taking a deceased relative's books to collection and didn't know that this object was in there. Uh, it is, you know, we can all kind of guess on it. And I also briefly want to say that even though I'm saying that uh, handmade uh, paper cuts, handmade schnirrschitte sort of fell out of style uh, by the 1850s with the rise of paper lace, uh, they, it did not stop being made. Uh, people kept giving gifts to each other. And there are many Schneerenschitte artists and other paper cut artists who continued to work and are still making work today. Uh, the Guild of American Paper Cutters was founded in 1988 and is headquartered in Somerset County, Pennsylvania. And that's what I have to say about this object. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Claire. I think your project's been an exciting testament to how far um, a single object can go in terms of unlocking a history. Um, 
So our final presenter um, for tonight's program is Ashley Stahl. Ashley is a master's student in art history and arts administration at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture, as well as the assistant director of development and alumni relations for Temple University. She will be talking with us tonight about the Beecher Tilton affair and its curious afterlife on a piece of printed ephemera in the library company graphic arts collection. Thank you, Erin. Um, and while I'm sharing my screen, I also um, want to say thank you to Erica for being so helpful in my research personally. Um, I don't think that I would have been able to find out all of the things that I did about my object if it weren't for her and all of her help. So um, this class has been really wonderful and really well adapted to a virtual setting. So thank you both, Erin um, and Erica. So um, my object this evening is um, a puzzle card called the Beecher Tilton Puzzle. Um, it's four and a half by two and three quarter inches made of paper and dates back to 1875. The artist and the publisher are both unknown, but we do know that this was made using the photo engraving printing technique. Um, the center of the card features a bust portrait of Henry Ward Beecher, who was the most popular American Protestant preacher in the country during the late 19th century and would have been as famous as any A-list celebrity today. Um, here he looks distinguished and stoic in his three-piece suit, and at first glance it might just look like a typical print of a portrait on paper, um, but the image gets a bit more interesting as your eye moves from Beecher to this diamond shape, framing him. Um, and it might take a moment to realize, but he's actually framed uh, by a border of four thin black snakes. And then as your eye keeps moving toward the edges of the card, you realize that in the four corners, sort of disrupting these black horizontal lines are white lines that make up the divided portraits of a man and a woman. Um, I will admit that I did not notice the portraits on the outside <laughs> uh, on the borders of this print at first, so if you didn't either, um, don't feel bad. If you look closely, you can see half of a man's portrait is on the top left corner and it cuts off just beneath his nose. Um, and then the other half of him is on the bottom right corner, which I hope that you can see on the screen. Um, and then the woman is on the top, the, the top of her head is on the top uh, right corner and bottom is on the bottom left. Um, and this man and woman, they are husband and wife and their names are Theodore and Elizabeth Tilton. They were also quite prolific in their own right, mostly known for their work in the abolitionist and suffragist movements in the second half of the 19th century. Here I have a close up for you so you can see them a little bit better. Um, this is what they look like when the puzzle is put together. I hope you can see that. Um, so what is this card and why are there split up portraits of a man and wife on the outside? Um, interestingly, this card actually serves as an early example of celebrity private life as entertainment. It is representative of the story of an alleged affair between Henry Beecher and Elizabeth Tilton, a scandal that was so monumental that um, it's known today as the social scandal of the Gilded Age. So um, let's take a quick break from the object itself to talk about the backstory of the affair. Um, in 1847, a 34-year-old Henry Ward Beecher arrived in Brooklyn, New York to become the founding pastor of Plymouth Church. This church was a notable destination in the country, very modern and progressive, and is perhaps best known for being the church where Abraham Lincoln announced his position against slavery, a speech that is credited with winning him the Republican nomination for president. Um, this church still stands today, and they have a Henry Ward Beecher statue out front, pictured here. Um, he also, Beecher also made many memorable speeches here. He was an extremely gifted preacher and attracted the attention of big names like Walt Whitman and Ralph Waldo Emerson, who publicly endorsed his talents, which contributed to his celebrity status. In 1850, 
Two young teenagers named Theodore Tilton and Elizabeth Richards joined the Plymouth Church congregation and quickly became charmed by their pastor, as everyone was. Um, they thought he was wonderful and he aligned with almost all of their values. And in 1855, on Theodore's 20th birthday, the couple asked Beecher to officiate their marriage. A few years after the wedding, Beecher and Theodore became very close friends. Um, as I mentioned, they shared a lot of the same values. Both Beecher and Theodore were activists in the anti-slavery movement and even co-edited an abolitionist newspaper together in Manhattan. In the late 1860s, Elizabeth Tilton and Beecher started to become friendly as well. We know that the three um, were very close because hundreds of letters were written between Theodore and Elizabeth, which professed their love for one another, their marriage and their relationship with their pastor. It is evident from these letters that Beecher and Elizabeth experienced a deeply passionate bond of some sort. And in 1870, 15 years into their marriage, Mrs. Tilton wrote her husband a letter admitting that she had quote, gone too far in her knowing and loving of Beecher without any further detail of what exactly she had meant. At first, Beecher and the Tiltons agreed to try to keep whatever had happened a secret as they didn't want to be victims of a huge public scandal that could ruin all of their reputations. They were able to keep this a secret for two years, but alas, the Beecher Tilton story eventually got out and appeared in the press in the first, for the first time in October, 1872. The three friends denied the claims at first. They tried to move on with their lives as normal, but whispers about their affair continued within their circles and started to trickle out um, farther and farther. And two years later in 1874, Theodore actually ended up suing Henry for seducing his wife and committing adultery with her for over a year. This issue was taken to court and in the end, Beecher was found innocent despite pregnancy rumors and Elizabeth's 1878 confession to the affair. No one ever found out what really happened. And even to this day, historians study and analyze the letters between the Tiltons and Beecher and have admitted that the truth will most likely always be a mystery. During the trial, this scandal completely dominated all other news. It is said that every sentient American had followed the Beecher Tilton scandal and thousands of people read the trial transcripts in their daily newspapers. And you could even purchase tickets to the trial itself for $5. I have a photo of one of the trial tickets here because I just thought that was so hilarious. Um, in the summer of 1874, the New York Times released an editorial campaign against quote, an evil, which has existed for some time in our midst. And no, they were not referring to the deep racial conflict in the South at the time or the corrupt political climate in Washington, but rather they were referring to Theodore Tilton's adultery charge against his famous minister. I mentioned that to give you a sense of how preoccupied the public was with this affair at the time, so much so that um, they almost preferred it over real, real news, which I think our society still relates to, perhaps even more so today. Um, scandalous paparazzi photos, news coverage involving marriage and pregnancy scandals and magazine and newspaper articles describing intimate details of relationships between celebrities is all very normal and almost an expected part of our society at this point. Um, the fascination of the Beecher Tilton case can be compared to why we become obsessed with knowing the details about the marriage scandals of politicians and celebrities like JFK and Marilyn Monroe or Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton, or why we feel the need to keep up with the Kardashians as we do. Um, the media delving so deeply into the personal lives of couples was not common in the late 19th century to my understanding, but in its treatment, of the Beecher Tilton scandal, the press expanded their boundaries from reporting advertisements and politics into the realm of private lives of people and celebrities. Throughout my research process, I've wondered if the scandal may have been a change agent in the relationship between the press and society. Could this have been the beginning of, American, of the American practice of feeling entitled to someone else's privacy for entertainment purposes? I wonder. 
Now that we know the story of the affair, I want to revert our attention back to the puzzle card object itself and dive into the question of why it was made and what it was made for. The printing of trade cards like this first came to America in the 18th century and were first used to advertise consumer goods. The practice was modeled after examples from 17th century England. They became a popular choice of advertising due to their beautiful decorative styles and small size, and unlike other methods of advertising, often discarded or thrown in the trash and destroyed, um, people actually collected these cards, often keeping them in scrapbooks, which made them more effective than ads in newspapers, which got thrown away. In the beginning, these cards generally advertised luxury goods and were intended to appeal to a middle class literate audience. But in the 19th century, however, they developed more rapidly and were adapted to a wider variety of uses. They advertised everything from cigarettes to pharmacies to groceries, and they also began to feature political propaganda in the, as the 19th century progressed. Around when the Beecher Tilton puzzle card was created in 1875, illustrated cards like this reached the height of their popularity with the American people who became obsessed with collecting them. Stemming from and even more effective than the traditional trade card were games and toys as a means of claiming and retaining attention. Many of these games were saved in scrapbooks and albums as well, which explains how the Beecher Tilton puzzle has been so well preserved. These games were usually black and white and were sold for a penny each or sometimes even less. In many homes, they were the sole source of intellectual challenge. Some puzzles contained hidden words or phrases within larger unassuming images of animals or landscapes. Another form of puzzle was a hidden object trade card in which a face or figure would be hidden within an intricate drawing. Also popular were the maze and the mystery drawing in which numerous dots were to be linked with a pencil. This is similar to what you'd find on the back of a kid's menu at restaurants today. I included this example that has been recently acquired by the Philadelphia Library Company um, that I was fortunate enough to be able to see in person, thanks to Erica. Um, please forgive the cell phone photo and the glare. Um, but this is an advertisement for Dr. David, Jane and Son in Philadelphia, instructing the user to, remove, to move the tag Remedy from the right-hand loop to the left-hand loop, bringing Remedy and Milady together, which I thought was kind of fun. Um, in the case of our Beecher Tilton puzzle card, it's meant to be folded in a particular way so that as the card gets smaller and smaller with each fold, the Tilton's portrait halves match up to make their faces whole, and eventually you're left with a tiny piece of folded paper. I actually did print it out to test for myself, and when I do it, it turns into a small triangle that looks like this. Um, I'm not sure if this is how it's meant to be done, but I tried a few different ways and this is the way that makes the most sense. This particular game reminds me of Puzzle Purse Valentines, which were also popular during the 19th century. Um, and also I remember making versions of these myself in middle school in the late 90s. Valentine puzzle purses were square pieces of decorated paper which were folded origami style to form a star or a box or an envelope, and then they unfolded to reveal romantic poems or trinkets. I wonder if the irony that these types of puzzle games were typically made to be a confession of love was not lost on the artists of the Beecher Tilton puzzle. The last point that I'll leave you with is that research into the circumstances, personalities, and ramifications of this famous scandal and the artwork that was created to exploit it helps us understand some of the fundamental issues confronting middle-class Americans in the mid-Victorian era. Historian Richard Whitman Fox writes that the infatuation of the Beecher Tilton scandal was a result of the threat it posed to the bedrock of the bourgeois marriage. People were forced to face the truth that men of God and prominent middle-class churches were not perfect and that marriages were complicated no matter what your tax bracket is. I think that's some good um, food for thought and an interesting way to end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. 
So I think we can all come back now um, and answer any questions we might have. As, you, as people are typing in their questions to the Q&A tab, I thought I would start our group off with one of my own. Um, and I was just wondering if I could ask you three to reflect on your experience of remote research this semester and how it's shaped your projects. I know all of you really began your work without seeing the objects in person. Um, and you were supposed to be thinking deeply about the material and visual characteristics. So um, did you find that that changed, the, affected the kinds of questions that you asked of the historical artifacts? Um, and did that pose problems for you or were there any unexpected silver linings that came out of the process? That's directed to all of you. So you can just jump in if one of you has a, a ready answer. I can start. Um, I have found that, um, like for my object in particular, since it's on lined paper, I thought that um, if I did a lot of research into the, like the history of lined paper, that would really like help uh, pin it down to like a really specific year. And it totally doesn't. Um, but there's definitely been a silver lining in that um, there. The, the Temple Library has so many, access to so many databases that uh, I really can comb through lots of primary and secondary sources. And so even if I did have access to like a library in person, I would still be doing a lot of this digital research. Um, and I think something about the, the nature of the library company's digital archive is that it makes me think about how objects are related to each other in different ways. Like, um, like my two uh, lace objects being next to each other. Uh, I, I only realized the connection that they had uh, of this like rise and fall of this particular kind of folk art like last night as I was like finalizing my PowerPoint. And I was like, oh, that's really sweet. And they're, it's really sweet that they're like next to each other digitally since I've been looking at this um, paper cut for uh, many weeks now, I've also been seeing that piece of paper lace so much. So it's nice that I also get to investigate that uh, simultaneously. I think two of the effects of starting off digitally for me were um, one that Erica kindly provided me with a transcript of the narrative that Anne Lewis wrote in her album. So I spent a lot of time with the text that I might not have if I was just sitting in person with this, <laughs> with Ann Lewis's, you know, very beautiful, but very slanty 19th century handwriting. Um, so I, I really focused on how her, her narrative informs the images and vice versa in the album. Um, and I also was able to, you know, the, the library company has done such a beautiful job digi digitizing these things. Um, and I was able to really easily cross-reference all the images in the album. Whereas when I was able to finally go in and sit with it, that was, that was wonderful and added a whole other literal dimension um, to my research. But I couldn't, you know, flip back and forth quickly looking for piecing together, like, oh, is this what is this watercolor of the same dining room with the same water, uh, same wallpaper that appears in this photograph. Um, so starting my research with the digitized version really allowed some of that. It really facilitated that detective work without having to carefully flip one page of this very old album at a time. Um, so that there have been benefits. I also think it was really helpful that we had sort of the entire semester to, to work on this project and we, we turned in different parts of the assignment um, every couple of weeks, which was really helpful for me personally. I think that I'm not alone in saying that in the pandemic, you, you thought you were going to have much more time for research and, and you were going to be, you know, writing these rock star papers, but I am so much more distracted, so much more tired. So the structure of, of this class in that we had to turn in, you know, we had to choose the object and then turn in the, um, 
primary source bibliography and then the annotated bibliography. And, and then I was actually fortunate enough to go to the library company to see the object in person, which I was a game changer for me, which might sound silly, but because it's only a little tiny paper card, but Erica had pulled all of these other little games that they had just acquired, which was really helpful. And she and I started talking and she gave me ideas for books. And then I stopped it at Temple Library on the way home and was just sort of re-energized to just dive into the research of this project. Um, so that was really helpful. And I think also a testament to how important it is to go to a library and to go to an archive of the object if you can. Um, and that these limitations that we have right now are really hard, but I do think we're, we're doing the best we can for sure. I, I, I mean, we have a few minutes for a couple questions and I, I, I have a couple questions that I will ask, um, but I just wanted to thank um, Ashley, Claire and Emily. I thought those were wonderful presentations and you know, thank you um, so much um, for your um, words of, um, uh, I'm gonna say praise, but I mean, I'm, I'm so glad you had such a um, great experience with uh, the library company and um, collaborating with the visual culture program um, so that you could, you know, work with the objects and, and provide these wonderful presentations. Um, like I said, I have a couple questions. I know it's, it's uh, right a little bit before eight, so I'll, I, we shall hopefully have time. Um, I have to admit one of the questions is for me. So I'll start with the question that's not for me. Um, and this is a question um, for Claire. Um, it's um, to the extent you know the provenance of the objects left in books, does there seem to be any connection between the type of object, um, for example, keepsake versus news clipping, and the type of book in which it was found, for example, novel versus history book? That's such a great question. And I must admit that uh, as far as I know, there is no record of the book from which these objects have came. So we don't know, um, you know if it was a history book and a newspaper clipping and things like that. Uh, I do know from personal experience, um, like growing up, my mother was really obsessed with pressing flowers. So any like really big book, you would probably find a couple flowers in. So I think sometimes um, for objects that are, the goal is to keep them stable, you want like a big book, but that's speculation as far as I know. But thank you for the question. Oh, and I'm sorry, Claire. And I think this also speaks to um, you know what Claire mentioned, how we changed our process um, because it is it's and, and keeping these materials we find in books now in the actual books because it does. I mean, I think it's it's great as Claire um, pointed out in, in her presentation. You can um, sort of start to make conjectures and you know think about um, you know various um, different um, viewpoints. You know as to how you know the, the how the materials got into the book, what the type of, of book is. But now that we are keeping the materials um, with the books, that you don't have to play that. That guessing game and it provides um, you know, another um, spoke in sort of the, the wheel of understanding um, what's going on with the visual and material culture um, of the item. So um, thank you for that question and thank you Claire for that, that great answer. Um, so I think there's um, a little bit of time for the question um, that was um, posed um, my way and others um, you know, should feel free to potentially um, jump in. Uh, but the question um, to me was, um, can I describe the logistics of making the rare objects available for research? Um, did um, I use Zoom with individual students? Um, um, handle objects, um, et cetera. Um, so um, what we um, did, um, like I said, you know, initially our, our thought was hopefully to have um, sort of collection reviews or object um, presentations um, on site. But uh, in this age of, of COVID, um, we did um, realize, you know, we had to go to uh, more of a, a digital um, focus um, for the, the presentations. Um, so I must admit, um, when this um, started, the library um, company um, was closed um, to, to readers um, at that point. Um, we kind of shifted a little bit um, that we did open um, for a while um, to um, readers who are not our fellows, but um, then um, sort of given um, numbers and staff capacity, we did um, have to go back to just working um, with our fellows. That's my sort of roundabout way of saying that we um, initially started out um, with um, power pre uh, presentations, Aaron and I, where there was four classes where um, I would, uh, I spearheaded two and then Aaron um, spearheaded two and we um, focused on materials um, from the library company's digital collections in our PowerPoints um, on um, various um, themes like I, I think I mentioned, you know, optics and, and illusion or um, you know, sort of the albums um, and, and scrapbooks. So it, each um, class had that, that focus theme. Um, and then when uh, there was some availability for um, students to come in and look at the original materials, um, we set up um, appointments. Um, everything um, is 
and was uh, by appointment um, at the library company. Um, so I knew that the, and, and previous to that, we did also have discussions of what um, the, the object that was being chosen, and that's where we had some of the, um, the reference interviews, and I had some other ideas of materials that could complement um, the research, um, and sort of in the case with Ashley, she mentioned, so I pulled materials I thought would be helpful in providing a, a, a bigger context um, to the to the puzzle um, print or um, for um, Emily um, saying, hey, there's all these other Lewis uh, scrapbooks and geological materials you might want to look at. Or for Claire, like, hey, all these other things found in, in, in books. Um, and also, I was really pleased to see that um, Nancy Rosen got into your presentation. That was someone I mentioned um, to, to Claire. So I think there was very much a way that even though a lot of this was digital, digitally um, not on site, um, that it was still a really rewarding experience and that, um, you know, we, we, you know, we too at the library company have shifted to providing, um, uh, you know, uh, remote um, reference that I think um, is, is just as meaningful and as effective as, as when we're um, on site. So I know it's a very long answer, but hopefully um, that answered um, uh, the question. And um, again, I, I was just so pleased to hear all of your um, talks. Um, it's a little after eight. I think um, Will potentially wanted to pop back in to just to do a little um, sort of um, fireside chat um, uh, discussion again, or um, but maybe I'm wrong about that. We'll see if Will, he might be. <laughs> oh, there he is. Here <laughs> I am. Uh, so, um, Will, I think you wanted to maybe make some final remarks this evening. Well, or just very, very briefly, because I know that we're just past eight. Um, first off, thank you all. That was fabulous. Um, I love being an attendee for once. Uh, it's much better this way, actually. <laughs> and uh, second, um, we have a second edition of this. I know Aaron is going to be reconvening with either three or four additional graduate students. Four, even better. Uh, same time, same place next Thursday. But in the meantime, for all of you who, who, who have registered, if there is um, somebody who you think would really enjoy this, we'll have a recording of this available on our YouTube channel, which I'll be circulating within the next week. So with that, Please uh, join me in thanking uh, all of these folks very quietly from uh, your various perches and join us again next Thursday, 7 p.m. again. Bye-bye.